Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Rebecca King. I'm on the board of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm hosting today's program from Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States. It's midday here, but 6 p.m. in the Netherlands, and we very much appreciate our presenter, Dr. Gert John Lammers, giving up some of his evening to speak to us today. So it's very exciting that researchers in different parts of the world are thinking about the diagnosis of IH and narcolepsy. In Europe especially, researchers have been considering whether the tests and criteria used to diagnose these disorders are comprehensive enough to include all the patients suffering from excessive daytime sleepiness. Last year, Dr. Lammers and 14 of his European colleagues published a paper titled Diagnosis of Central Disorders of Hypersomnolence, a reappraisal by European experts. I'm really appreciative that Dr. Lammers is going to tell us more about this new proposal in just a few minutes. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Avdel Pharmaceuticals, Harmony Biosciences, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and Takeda Pharmaceutical Company. Their support helps make this program possible and allows us to offer it as a free event. I also need to add this disclaimer, the Hypersomnia Foundation does not endorse any medication or treatments and does not provide any medical advice either during this presentation or on our website. Please talk to your own medical provider about your personal health needs and concerns. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Gert John Lammers is a prominent sleep researcher and clinician in the Netherlands. He trained as a neurologist and clinical neurophysiologist at Leiden University Medical Center, then earned a PhD at Leiden University with a thesis titled Narcolepsy. He is currently a professor of neurology at Leiden University, and the primary focus of his research is on narcolepsy and related sleep disorders. Dr. Lammers is one of the founding members of the European Narcolepsy Network, which is an organization of researchers across all of Europe and he served as the president of the organization from 2007 until 2014. In 2013, he obtained the qualification of somnologist from the European Sleep Research Society. And after founding a new sleep wake center in 2013, he became the medical director of all three sleep wake centers of the SEIN, which is the Dutch Center of Excellence for Epilepsy and Sleep Disorders. Dr. Lammers is the current chair of the Dutch Society for Sleep Medicine. So Dr. Lammers, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And now I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you, because it's, it's really pleasure to, let's say, discuss a proposal, a proposal for an improvement of the current classification of sleep disorders, particularly the chapter on central disorders of hypersomnolence on behalf of a whole group of European experts. And I hope to make clear why we want to change um, the, <coughs> the classification and also why it would be an improvement if we could change it according to our proposal. But I'm really honored to, to, to be invited for you as, as an important sleep uh, foundation. In fact, ultimately, all what we do is, well, to improve your situation. So it's very important to learn from your feedback if you agree that our proposal for improvement in the deed would be an improvement. So I'm also looking forward to the discussion that will follow our presentation. And also, if I'm not clear during my presentation, please feel free to, to comment. Then I can try to explain uh, what I would maybe not explain uh, good enough. Great. This is indeed the paper that already was referred to by Rebecca, in which we uh, let's say have published our proposal and I will ex well present, let's say a summary. These are <coughs> the diagnostic categories in, in the current classification of sleep disorders. There's narcolepsy type one and two, there's idiopathic hypersomnia, and then there are several others, hypersomnia due to medical disorder, to medical substance uh, abuse or to medication associated with psychiatric disorder and insufficient sleep syndrome. We will come back on this later on. I also want to make clear what do we consider as a, the main problems of the current classification. I think the most important problem is that people may not receive a diagnosis despite suffering from serious problem. That is the number one reason to, to uh, adjust the current classification. 
Then there also is the serious risk that sleep deprivation is not identified as a cause for complaints. And the last one is that the current classification relies very much on the MS2 result. And it's becoming more and more clear that the MS2 results in many diagnoses are not very consistent over time. So a next classification should not rely that much on the MSLT result. Okay, then please the next slide. Then let me start with the first case. And I want to explain to you, these are not all real cases, but they could have been real cases for sure. And this is the first patient. I will discuss three patients. Um, this is a 42 years old male, already who already has complaints for quite a long time. And the main complaint on a daily basis is an ability to stay awake during the day, particularly in monotonous situations. And he also experienced a feeling of sleepiness throughout the day. There may be episodes of automatic behavior, and he also have difficulty with sustained attention. And one of the expressions for that is that he is not able to read a book anymore. Regarding the Night, there are frequent awakenings during nocturnal sleep, but there is no problem with initiation of nocturnal sleep. Then there's another complaint that he may have nodding of the neck and buckling of the knees and laughing out loud. And this is a required um, experience. He didn't have this experience before, uh, before the complaint started. He has no medical history, no relevant medical history and no medication. So these were the symptoms, and then we performed several ancillary investigations. The first is the upward sleepiness score. You're probably familiar with the score. This is, let's say, a short questionnaire that quantifies sleepiness, and the maximum score is 24, and a score above 10 is considered to be abnormal. So 16 is, is let's say, a bit in the middle of severity of excessive daytime sleepiness. Then we also performed actigraphy, and because I'm not sure whether you're familiar with actigraphy, uh, I will explain uh, what is exactly actigraphy. It's something you could compare with a Fitbit. It's your word uh, on the rest, and it's measuring activity. And the simple idea behind it is that when you're awake, you're almost always moving something. So there will be always some activity detected. And if you sleep at least quietly during the night, there will be hardly any activity. And this provides the opportunity to get an impression of patterns of sleep and wake over longer periods, up to several weeks. And what we present here is one week actigraphy. And what you see now, oh, I, I'm not sure, you probably can't see my mouse because <laughs> I'm not projected, but let me try to explain without the mouse. What you can see is, uh, the measurement for one week and it's starting on Wednesday the 5th of October and it's ending on Tuesday the 11th of October and every row is one day so 24 hours and it starts at noon in the middle it's midnight and the end it's again noon and that continues in the row under the previous one so you can put the whole week uh, let's say in a sort of a column then you see several colors and the pink uh, is the most important. Uh, the pink is the period in which uh, the person is lying in bed for nocturnal sleep. They also see green. Green are periods of daytime sleep. And you can see yellow. The <coughs> watch is not only uh, capable of detecting motion, but also of detecting light. And when it's light detected, it's yellow. And then finally in black, it's where it's named after the more activity, the more black and the less activity, the less black you can see. And I explained the most important, in fact, is, is the pink. And what you can see in the pink is that the time this person, well, initiates nocturnal sleep is relatively consistent, but the time of raising is very variable. So it's not a really regular scheme, but what's even more important, it's only six hours, 10 minutes in bed. That means that total sleep time must be less than six hours, 10 minutes. And it seems to be a bit short, but we come back on this later again. Then we performed a nocturnal polysonography, and this is a different way to present it. I'm not sure again if you're used to um, look at these uh, so-called hypnograms. I will explain again. 
it's starting at, at 6 p.m. That is 1800, and it's uh, ending about 7 uh, a.m. in the morning. And you see when the line is up, you see there's written wake, then the person is awake. And when the line is going down, a person is asleep. And the further it's going down, the more deep a person is asleep. And you also see the black or, or the blue lines, and these are periods of REM sleep. And what you can see also in text under the, the graphic is that there is a short sleep, la sleep latency of four minutes, and the slow to sleep time is a little more than six hours. When you look at, at the results, there are, let's say, two. Uh, abnormalities. The first is that the nocturnal sleep is almost immediately uh, starting from the beginning with REM sleep. And you also see so-called fragmentation. You see that there are a lot of shifts between sleep stages and as a result there also are quite a lot of short wake periods. So there is a sleep onset REM period and there is fragmentation, but there is a very short sleep latency, a relatively good efficiency, and you see some other stages. AHI, that's the apnea hypopnea, hypopnea index, that's six, that's a little too high. And there also is a periodic limp movement index. In this case, these are leg movements, and also that is a little bit too high. And we will also return on that later on. The last infection, that's the multiple sleep latency test. And well, that's considered to be the objective test to, let's say, objectify and quantify daytime sleepiness. What you ask a person is to lay down in a bed in a dark, quiet room uh, four or five times a day. This time it was five times a day. And you ask this person to try to fall asleep. And we can see as a result here is that this person was able to fall asleep five out of five opportunities. And the mean sleep latency was 3.8 minutes. And you also see that in two occasions there was REM sleep, so-called sleep onset REM periods. And it's important to explain that, let's say, this test is abnormal regarding sleep latency when the mean sleep latency is less than eight minutes. So this is far below eight minutes. And if there are two or more SORAMs, this is suggestive of narcolepsy. So we have a person with a complaint of daytime sleepiness. There are strange attacks of muscle weakness elicited by, by emotions, particularly positive emotions. We have a short sleep duration, at least regarding nocturnal sleep. We have an abnormal nocturnal uh, sleep, sleep on some REM period, fragmentation, and we have an abnormal MSLT. So what would be the diagnosis? And unfortunately, we cannot really vote in these circumstances, but okay, just keep in mind where you vote for and I return to that. This is the second patient. This is again a male, a bit younger, 20 year, two years old. Complaints since only four months, but they seem to be progressive. That was an inability to stay awake during the day. Again, the monotonous situations. He also experienced sleepiness throughout the day. He also experienced automatic behavior, and he also has difficulty with sustained attention. In this case, there's no complaint of nocturnal sleep. And when asking explicitly about muscle weakness, he explained that he may experience weakness in the legs after strong emotions and that he often has the feeling that he needs to sleep after having had strong emotions. Then there is a relevant medical history, particularly he's suffering from restless legs, but these are well controlled with a low dose of an opiate oxycodone in the evening. We had the same ancillary investigations and surprisingly there was the same score, 16 out of 24. And also in this person, we performed actigraphy. Yes, the, well, that's surprising again. It's, it's remarkably similar, this actigraphy. Again, you see that, that there is this short time spent in bed and also the difference between nights uh, for the time spent in bed. Then we have nocturnal sleep again, and you will not be surprised anymore. But again, you see a similar result compared to the first patient. There's the sleep onset REM period, fragmented sleep, short sleep latency, and also a relatively short total sleep time. And again, there is a little too much breathing disturbance in the night and also a bit too much limb movements. And again, you will not be surprised. 
Their MSLT is abnormal in exactly in the same way as the first patient. There is a latency of 3.8 in minutes and two sleep and set REM periods. And you will not be surprised by the next slide. Uh, please show the next slide. Again, the question is, what is the diagnosis? And I will return later to the second case, but let me first return to the first case, because in my opinion, I will explain why this is a typical narcolepsy type one patient. Why is it a typical patient? Let me first go to the current classification, what is written about criteria for narcolepsy type one. Then there's the criterion A, that there must be a daily <coughs> complaint of irrepressible need for sleep. And that's in fact what this patient was, uh, was explaining. That was his main complaint. And there is criterion B, that there must be the presence either of a low hypercretin concentration. Well, I didn't provide information on that. Or, and I did provide information uh, on this part, there should be typical cataplexy and a mean sleep latency, as I already explained, of less than eight minutes and two or more REM periods when performing MSLT. So in fact, this patient, well, fulfills the criteria set for RCSD3. And in fact, we do not suggest to change much on this. And I return to that as well. To cataplexy, because it's important because I can provide any comment on, on, on the movie I showed you. But what is typical cataplexy? I think it's important to know because this is a very important symptom. In fact, if you have this symptom, you can be already sure about the diagnosis. Typical cataplexy is what's written here, sudden bilateral loss of muscle tone, usually starting in the face or neck or in the legs, the feeling of buckling of the knees, with or without involvement of the arms, and it can just remain in the face and neck or remain in the knees, or it may progress to other, it will spread to other muscles and may increase in <coughs> uh, extent of weakness. And ultimately, in severe cases, what was shown on the movie, it may lead to a fall. Other typical uh, criteria are it's triggered by emotions, and we can return to the patient. What was the emotion? I think that was a typical positive emotion, but we can discuss this. Usually, duration is up to one minute, usually particularly when it's a partial attack is much shorter, but a complete attack as I showed you in the movie is usually up to one minute. It can be a bit longer. And what you cannot see from the movie, but what I can explain to you that consciousness is explained. When somebody has experienced such an attack, he or she is able to explain exactly in detail what was going, <coughs> what was happening around them as, as let it prove that they were conscious, but just at that moment not able to respond. So this is typical cataplexy. And in fact, if there is typical cataplexy that overrules any other possible diagnosis when making a diagnosis uh, in the context of hypersomnolence. Okay, I explained, I will return to the second patient later on, but let's first move on to the last patient, patient number three. Again, a 20 years old mill also complains that are not long present uh, at the moment of presentation. And this male feels sleepy throughout the day, may fall asleep in monotony situation, and also has difficulty with sustained extension. And like the previous patients, is not able to read the book anymore. And despite sleeping several hours longer than he used to do, he has this daytime complaint, complaint of sleepiness. He also has difficulty to raise in the morning. It needs time. Uh, he's sleep drunken in the morning. It really takes time before he falls, feels fully awake and maybe he even doesn't feel fully awake during the entire day. There's not a real complaint about nocturnal sleep and there is no weakness of any muscle during induced by any emotion, positive or negative. There is no relevant medical history, no indication of any comorbid psychiatric disorder uh, and no use of medication. Here we also performed the effort sleepiness skill. You see 14 out of 24, that's also a higher score, but, but less high than in the previous patients. 
there you see the actigraphy again. This is a much different pattern when compared to the previous ones. You can see here that this quite a regular schedule for nocturnal sleep, and you see that this man uh, spends more than 10 hours in bed, suggesting that he will probably sleep also quite a long time, uh, but may be comparable to what he explained during history take. This is the result of the nocturnal sleep polysonography, also quite different, which you can see. Um, there's less fragmentation, there's no sleep onset REM period. There also is a relatively short uh, sleep density of seven minutes, and so the sleep time is much longer, eight hours, 51 minutes. And you see that there are no breathing problem and there are no <coughs> increased, there's no increased number of limb movements in this patient. So this is quite a different pattern. But what you have to keep in mind, this patient, well, was forced to wake up earlier than, than he used to because he needed to return to the sleep center to have the MSOT performed. Then you see the result of the multiple sleep latency test the next day. Again, like the previous patients, there are <coughs> five nap opportunities and he fell asleep in all the five opportunities, although the mean latency is 9.3 minutes and there is no REM sleep. There is the same question again, what is the diagnosis? And maybe you may ask yourself, okay, what is the diagnosis according to the ICSD-3? And what is the diagnosis according to your opinion? And this always suggests that there might be a difference between uh, both decisions. Why did I present this case? What do we want to make clear? Again, it's clear because Patient one and two have the same result for ancillary investigation that they cannot be real patients, but again, these could both have been real patients. That's very important to realize. And the interesting thing is that in the first patients, it's totally clear what's the diagnosis. And that's totally clear in the ICD-3-3 and also totally clear in the proposal we did for adjustments. But in the second patient, it's very difficult. I will explain to you that he applies for at least three diagnoses, at least three sleep diagnoses. But interesting enough, he doesn't qualify, at least according to the current classification, for NT1 or NT2. And more interesting, when he would have consulted the psychiatrist, he would probably have <coughs> qualified for the diagnosis ADHD. So that's also a problem that it's not really clear where, let's say, ends ADHD and where starts a hypersomnolence disorder. This was regarding the first patients, the first two, but regarding the last patient. I presume you agree that this person has a serious problem, but according to the current classification, doesn't qualify for any diagnosis. This is, let's say, a short summary of, of criteria needed in the current uh, RCSD3. And what you can see that, that the complaint about excessive daytime sleepiness cannot differentiate in the current classification in, let's say, probable diagnostic category. That's remarkable, and I'll return to that later on. Then it's interesting that for some disorders, you need to have complaints for more than three months and not for others. And what's also very important is that MSL3 required is only required for narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. For the other diagnostic categories, you don't need to perform an MSLT. And what's also quite remarkable, that's the next column, for NT2, narcolepsy type 2, and idiopathic hypersomnia, you need to rule out chronic sleep deprivation as a cause for the complaint, and you also need to rule out other causes for the complaint. This is not necessary for NT1, and also not necessary for all the other disorders that are part of the ICSD-3. Uh, at least sleep deprivation is not needed to be ruled out. And also surprising is that for only narcolepsy type 2, you need to rule out sleep apnea as cause for the complaints during daytime and not for all the others. And this has implications. 
because if you go back to patient two, I explained there might be up to three diagnoses. He does not qualify for N21 because there's no cataplexy. Then you may ask, okay, may he qualify for NT2? Well, the answer is no, because we cannot be sure that there is no sleep insufficiency, sleep deprivation as cause. And the same holds true for idiopathic hypersomnia. Then he could qualify for sleep apnea as cause, he could qualify for substance use as cause, and what I already explained, he probably qualifies for insufficient sleep as cause. Here you see the, the schedule again, what I explained. You need to rule out sleep deprivation as cause before you make the diagnosis narcolepsy type 2 or idiopathic hypersomnia. So therefore, this patient does not qualify. And for narcolepsy type 2, you also need to rule out uh, sleep apnea. And then I return to this patient because I explained he's not suffering from cataplexy. That's why I explained in more detail what is typical cataplexy. This person may experience muscle weakness with some relation to emotion, but it's not triggered by the emotion. It's not typical positive emotion. It's not really muscle weakness, but it's more yeah, some subjective feeling that maybe somebody may also feel when laughing out loud or something. This is not typical cataplexy. Therefore, it does not qualify for idiopathic hypersomnia. And then it's important to realize he is using an opiate. And, and opiates are listed as possible causes for hypersomnolence due to substance use or medication use. And here you can see the criteria for hypersomnia due to medication or substance. There it is written abuse, but it's maybe medication use. You are not, or it's not needed to rule out in sleep insufficiency as a cause. It's not needed to rule out sleep apnea. So you might make this diagnosis. But I think this is very important. I know that, that in the US, people tend to sleep not very long. But for many persons, six hours in bed will, will implicate that there should be less than six hours sleep per night. And for most persons, this is not enough to be fully awake during daytime. So this is at least suggestive for sleep deprivation. So at least you should try to correct it. And only if complaints remain after correction, you may conclude that sleep deprivation was not a cause or not the only cause for the complaint. Also here again, nocturnal sleep, there was written that the AHI is six and well, the limit for, let's say, a normal uh, index is five. So this is above the limit. So in fact, this person also qualifies for the diagnosis OSA. But then you have the difficult, what's the hierarchy in, in the current classification? What to do if a person qualifies for so many different diagnoses? And that's not clear in the current classification. Then patient three, why is patient three not qualifying for any ICSD diagnosis? Here you see the criteria for idiopathic hypersomnia in the current classification. There must be a daily uh, complaint of excess or daytime sleepiness. Of course, he qualifies for that. There is absent cataplexy, which I explained. Uh, there is the MSLT that is abnormal, but there is a problem. <coughs> The MLCT should be abnormal. What I explained, it should be a mean sleep length test of less than eight minutes, or there should be during nocturnal sleep a sleep duration of more than 11 hours. And he does not qualify for both criteria. He had a mean sleep latency of more than nine minutes and no sleep at onset REM periods, and nocturnal sleep was less than 11 hours. Therefore, this person does not qualify for any diagnosis. And you also have the difficulty how to take into account that this person had to raise early to be in time at the sleep center to have the MSLT performed. And that's something that's also not solved in the current classification. Then you may ask again, okay, I explained already twice that this may not have been real patients, but, but they could have been real patients. But I, I can explain that I see quite a lot of uh, patients resembling the problem that is, let's say, discussed in, in patient three. Um, and in my opinion, these patients do deserve a diagnosis and do deserve treatments. And in the current classification, 
well, they do not deserve a diagnosis and therefore you should do not deserve a treatment. And I think that should really be adjusted. Um, and we also need to be more clear and consistent how to interpret data. What's the hierarchy of findings on ancillary investigations? So what are the problems with the ICSD3? There are quite a lot. It's not complaint driven, but I did not spend too much time on that. And several of the others listed have been discussed. I will call in more detail that, that the complaint of EDS is, is, is not, let's say, uh, taken into account. It, it, it's limited to an inability to stay awake and all the other aspects are not listed, although they may be relevant, which I may explain. It's not very consistent that I showed for some disorders, you need to exclude sleep insufficiency for others need for some, you need to exclude sleep apnea for others not. Then there's always listen that you must, for in some cases, exclude uh, chronic sleep deprivation, but it's not explained what is chronic sleep deprivation or how should it be excluded. It's only mentioned, but the, there's no, guideline how, how to identify or how to treat it. Then as already explained, it's heavily relying on MCT result. I will not in, go into detail about that, but that's also a problem that people may shift from diagnosis, although they have no change in their complaint and that that's very confusing for many, not only for patients, but also for uh, insurance companies. Another thing is that there are no levels of certainty with in contrast to daily practice, something you're not fully sure, then it's better to explain there is not certain. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Oh, being not certain of a diagnosis does not mean that you're not certain that there is a serious problem. Then the last one is that sleep apnea is fully separated in the current classification, although sleep apnea is the disorder that is most frequently uh, associated with excessive daytime sleepiness is much more prevalent than the disorders listed in the current classification in the chapter of central disorders of hypersomnolence. Now I want to go into more details about the complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness, because I, well, we believe there are more dimensions and they are not mentioned in the ICS-3. Let me show what's listed in the ICS-3. This is what is written about the complaint excessive daytime sleepiness that are daily periods of irrepressible need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep occurring for at least three, at least three months. This is written for narcolepsy type one. This is identical for type two, also identical for idiopathic hypersomnia, also identical for hypersomnia to medical disorder, also identical for hypersomnia due to medication or substance abuse, also for hypersomnia associated with psychiatric disorder. So it's, let's say it's a bit like one size fits all. And we believe that it is important to take into account other dimensions of hypersomnia as well, because this may be important also for treatment. It may guide treatment. It's not only about falling asleep. It's also about other aspects such as attention, but I come back to that uh, later on. Uh, what is very important further is that you make clear, is there a lifestyle problem or is there a real sleep disorder? And it's also very important that we try to base treatment on what the patient regards as the most disturbing problem and not just guide by what is written in reviews or what's written or advertised by, by pharmaceutical companies you must ask your patient, what is your problem? And you must try to improve the problem that is explained by the patient. And I made clear that cataplexy is essential for the diagnosis narcolepsy. And there is not much discussion. The discussion starts and the confusion starts and the misdiagnosis starts if there's not typical cataplexy. So what do we suggest as European expert to improve? We suggest to improve the definition of excessive daytime sleepiness and also to make a separation in excessive daytime sleepiness and excessive need for sleep. I will come back on that later. And it's quite typical. The first two cases I presented had EDS and the last one is a typical case of ENS. 
Then we should adjust the diagnostic criteria to reduce the possibility that a serious problem will not fulfill the diagnostic criteria and will prevent this person to have a treatment that would be needed. We also must prevent that the diagnosis relies too much on the MLCT because I explained, not in detail, but that over time, results of MLCT, MLCT are usually not very consistent and you must try to prevent that this will lead to change in diagnosis or the confusion that is uh, added. Um, and we also need to be much more clear on what do we consider to be uh, sleep disorders induced by sleep deprivation and how do we rule out that a sleep disorder is caused by sleep deprivation. And then the last point, I didn't spend too much time on it, we must be sure that it's a sleep prob problem uh, and not, let's say, a problem with fatigue or other things. It must be an increased need for sleep or excessive daytime sleepiness and not fatigue. So what do we propose? In fact, we, we propose a more inclusive classification that in fact all subjects with a serious complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness or an excessive need to sleep can qualify for a diagnosis, but only and really only after exclusion of sleep deprivation and or sleep apnea as cause for the complaints. And we are also convinced to reliably assess sleep deprivation is not enough just to have a sleep diary. You really, really need to add also results of actigraphy. So what would be step one in our proposed classification? First assess whether it's typical cataplexy or not, because if it's present, then it's cataplexy type one. But if it's not, then first start to make the separation whether the complaint is excessive need for sleep or excessive daytime sleepiness. Because I think this is very important and this is in fact that inspired us to make the separation. Hypersomnia defined by an increased need for sleep may be considered that you are in fact in, indeed consumed by sleep. Although excessive sleep and sleepiness, that's quite typically an expression of narcolepsy, is more size by sleep and not an increased amount of sleep over the 24 hours of the day that are qualitatively different complaints and they are important to separate but the quest, they provide information about the cause and they are also important to guide treatment. So in our proposal we have the following proposal for what is excessive daytime sleepiness then there are several characteristics uh, of course, there's the feeling of daytime sleepiness that must be separated from fatigue, as I already explained. There is also the ability to stay awake in monotonous situations, but there can also be an acquired need for scheduled naps during the day, difficulty with sustained attention, and there may be automatic behaviors that be contribute to EDS. There may also be additional cognitive problems, mainly memory problems. And we defined in the presence of excess latency that at least symptom two uh, should be, uh, at least two of some symptoms of the list should be present. Um, so that is more inclusive and, well, this more aspects take into account than in the current classification in uh, the RCZ3. And this is excessive data on sleepiness. Then we also define excessive need for sleep. It's important that there is an increased amount of sleep that is needed and we set it as 10 hours in contrast to what is currently written uh, in the ICSD3 that's 11 hours or at least nine hours of neural sleep. Uh, there must be the presence of at least one of the listed symptoms of the excessive daytime sleepiness and it must be clear that sleep extension will not fully eliminate the daytime complaint. That's to make the separation with people who have a national uh, large need or an inborn large need for sleep. If you have an inborn large uh, need for sleep and you can fulfill this need, then you should not have a complaint anymore. That's a difference with idiopathic hypersomnia. Even if you try or can fulfill what seems to be the normal need for sleep, there will be remaining daytime problems. So that's the first step. <coughs> Make clear whether it's cataplexy 
And if there's no catapultic awareness, except for need for sleep or uh, except for daytime sleepiness. Um, and then if there is any doubt about insufficient sleep or sleep deprivation, just consider it to be sleep deprivation and advise the person to extend on neural sleep and also check again with echography whether the person was indeed able to extend the duration of neural, neural sleep. And only if the complaints remain after extending nocturnal sleep, then there is reason for further ancillary investigations. So this is how we suggest to, to act. It's not part of, uh, of the paper, but, but, but we can go through it. Central is the complaint of daytime sleepiness. What should be separated from fatigue and tiredness? Then if there is typical cataplexy, then it must be narcolepsy, although you must, let's say, objectify it with ancillary investigations. Then if there is no cataplexy, then make the separation in the left part of the slide is an inability to stay awake. Then you must exclude by using activity that there is not an explanation because there is <coughs> sleep deprivation. And if you have doubt, please first, uh, implement sleep extension. If sleep extension does not solve the problem, then consider that sleep apnea might be the cause. If you can exclude it as cause, or if you have doubts, you should, should first treat it. And then if there's no improvement on treatment, you have excluded this cause. And there's a remaining complaint, then perform the ancillary investigations that may objectify the presence of a real hypersomnolence disorder. And then it depends on the MSLT result whether it will be narcolepsy type two, or what we call, and that's a new category, idiopathic excessive daytime sleepiness. And I will come back on that later on. Then if there's not an ability to stay awake, let's return to the right part of, uh, of the slide. If there is an acquired increased need of sleep, so that I think that's important also make the separation from an inborn large need of sleep that there is an acquired increased need. And if you try to fulfill this acquired increased need and you still have problems during the day, then it should be a disorder. Uh, and then you should, if you have excluded again, sleep apnea, because sleep apnea could also be uh, a cause for this phenotype, although less frequent, then you must do the investigations and ancillary that and objectify the presence of idiopathic hypersomnia. Then it's important because we introduce levels of certainty. I already explained levels of certainty do not mean that if you have a probable uh, label that you don't have a serious complaint. The uncertainty only, let's say, refers to the certainty of the diagnostic category, not the certainty that there is a disorder of hypersomnolence, only an uncertainty of the correct diagnostic category. So then we come to what we suggest. We suggest for narcolepsy, not, well, the criteria are not much different from the criteria for RSD3 for NT1. And you can see that, well, the most important crucial is the presence of typical cataplexy. Then you have the definite diagnosis and only if you don't have a typical cataplexy, you don't qualify for definite, or if you have typical cataplexy, but not the typical support for ancillary investigations. So that's not much different from the, the current classic. And the only thing is that we prefer not to use uh, narcolepsy type 2 anymore, because that seems not to be a real entity. Then we have the very important category, idiopathic hypersomnia. And in fact, what you do here in the current classification is a bit hybrid. You may either have not an increased need for sleep and a short mean latency on the MSLT, or you may have an increased need of sleep and then it must be objectified that you sleep more than 11 hours per night. We in fact separated. We think we should reserve the label idiopathic carpal somewhere for those with an increased need for sleep and that it must be acquired again to separate it from an inborn large need for sleep. And then we want to have it objectified. 
We want to have objective variety, it's sleep, and it's not just staying in bed for longer periods of needing rest, it must be sleep. And then we suggest for level one that there's, in the first place, a confirmation with actigraphy, but in the second place, also a special protocol to objectify the increased need for sleep. And I return on that protocol later on the so-called 32 hours protocol. That's you know, how you can qualify for, for level one, but you can also qualify for idiopathic hypersomnia if you don't have this 32 hours clinical protocol performed, but the vendor is support uh, by using activography and there is support, but less strict uh, when performing polysomnography for nocturnal sleep. Then the last category, this is in fact, is a mixture of NT2 in the current classification and uh, a part of the uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, but those that are not characterized by an increased need for sleep. And we suggest to call this idiopathic acephal datum sleepiness, and you see the central complaint is sleepiness, but you must have excluded sleep deprivation and sleep apnea as cause. And there you can see there must be the complaint and then there are less strict MSOT criteria. And we also want to separate subtypes, subtypes, the so-called REM type that you see SOREMs on investigation, MSOT investigation, there has be a non-REM type where you don't see SOREMs. And there also may be a tension type that it's predominantly an attention problem that persons are suffering from. 32 hours protocol. This is suggested by the French group in Montpellier, by, by the group of Yves Dovalier. They published uh, one, let's say, validation study, and there they had four groups they studied. The first group was what they called clear-cut idiopathic hypersomnia. These were, were persons who were suffering from idiopathic hypersomnia according to the, crescent, uh, the current uh, ICSD-3. Then there was a group, a larger group, is probable idiopathic hypersomnia. This already indicates that there are quite a lot of persons who do not qualified for the current uh, uh, criteria in RCSD3. And then there were two groups in which idiopathic hypersomnia was not considered, but there was a complaint of hypersomnia associated with other problems, uh, or there was this small healthy control group. And what's relevant to explain that in, in the all patients groups, the majority were women, but in the healthy control group, it was about 50-50. We have the next slide. Then I will try to explain the protocol. It's, you can see it, it's, it's, it's quite demanding. There's first a polysomography during the night between 11 p.m. and 7 p.m. And then a modified MLCT is performed the next day. It's modified in the sense that when somebody falls asleep, he or she is immediately waken up. So the person is not able to have a long time spent asleep during the day, but still a sleep latency can be uh, assessed. Then the 32 hour protocol starts the night, the next night at 11 p.m. And then it's 32 hours to 7 p.m. Uh, two nights later and, and then in the morning and they make a separation in between, you can see uh, below, the first 24 hours uh, and the whole period of 32 hours. But then it's very important to realize the conditions because this 32 hour bed rest period indeed is bed rest. They need to stay in bed for 32 hours. There's no daylight, there's only dim light in the room. There's no television, no computer, no newspapers, no telephone, no watches, no visits and only communication with other persons about delivery of meals, of, of meals, and also there's no medication. And then they identified these results. In the upper gray uh, boxes, um, this is the result for the 32 hour protocol. And the other um, boxes are the results uh, in the lower ones for the 24 hour protocol. And what you can see for the 20, or the 32-hour protocol, if you uh, take the uh, 19 hours limit, then you see that all the, let's say, definite idiopathic hypersomnia patients, according to ICD-3, are or, or almost all of the criteria and also the majority of the probable, but hardly any of the other control groups. 
And the same holds true when you do the analysis for the 24 hour protocol and you put um, uh, the limit at 11 hours, then you see the same pattern that the patient groups who are suspected to suffer from idiopathic heart disease almost all qualify and the controls, uh, well, some of the, the, the third control group do, but the healthy controls hardly do. Uh, this was a very brief summary, but I think this is very important improvement, but there are also several drawbacks because this is very demanding and time consuming. It's also very expensive. The question also is what is the cold standard? Because currently the cold standard was used in Vector ICSD3, but, but nobody knows what is the cold standard. That's difficult. And also this was validated not against sleep deprived persons and not against narcolepsy. So I think there are still some questions to solve before we really should implement this. And the question is, will insurance companies ever uh, reimburse this protocol or should we continue the search for, let's say, a protocol that it's much more easy to apply and are less demanding and less expensive. So this is also my last slide to summarize. The mo most important uh, message is that if there is a serious complaint of hypersomnolence and sleep deprivation and sleep apnea as course are excluded, there should be made a diagnosis in the spectrum of hypersomnolence disorders. And there should be an option for treatment. And that's what we try to solve with our proposed uh, classification. The 32 hours protocol, maybe improvement, I suggest to use it particularly for, for scientific uh, protocols. I'm not sure if this is the solution, let's say for daily practice, uh, but okay, it's something uh, we may need to move forward. And we also think that by introducing this classification and also introduce levels of certainty, it will be much more easy uh, to find or to identify new biomarkers for the different disorders will also solve the problem of, of how to diagnose uh, the current disorders that we know. And it will also provide the possibility to change from diagnostic categories, but only if there is also a change in complaints and not only when there's just a change in the result of the MSLT. Okay, I thank you for your attention. I'm open for discussion. I hope I didn't take too much of your time and concentration, but let me know. All right, thank you so much. That was so much material. Yeah. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So for everybody in the audience, if you have a question you would like to ask Dr. Lammers, all you have to do is go to the bottom of your screen and hit the Q&A symbol, and you can type in your questions. We already have a few. That have come in, but I think now that um, you've kind of gone through all the material, we're going to get some more. <laughs> so shall we begin? Okay, um, so let's start with, uh, we have a question about if anybody uh, could possibly exhibit both ENS and EDS um, diagnoses at the same time, have the symptoms that it would be unclear which group they fall in. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, in fact, that, that's part of the definition, but, but, but there was a lot of information. Uh, also, those who suffer from an increased need of sleep may have complaints of excessive daytime sleepiness. That's even part of the definition. Uh, but usually, uh, their complaints are a bit less severe, but, but of course, there is a gray zone that people may qualify for both. Another possibility is that that's seen sometimes in narcolepsy that when the complaints start there's more let's say uh, the phenotype of excessive need of sleep and after several years it's changing it's to more the phenotype of excessive daytime sleepiness um, but there is some craze zone that you may consider a person to qualify for both but i think it i uh, would you well i think what we suggest is not to miss a problem I think it's not a problem if you qualify for both, 
what we what we want to have is that you have a diagnosis and adequate treatment. What we don't want is that you don't qualify for either EDS or uh, ENS. And although you have a serious problem, that is the intention. Yes, uh, and we greatly appreciate that. I mean, I, when I first heard you present on this topic, what really struck me the most was you, it was so obvious that doctors have patients that they truly believe have a hypersomnia, but you have no diagnosis to give them. So a major goal of this proposal was to fill in those gaps and, and make it so you could give a diagnosis and treatment to more people, which we greatly appreciate. So thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a couple of questions about lack of orexin as a biomarker for NT1. And um, can that deficiency ever show in NT2 or IH? Do other biomarkers or imaging provide a better path to diagnosis slash treatment than symptoms? Yeah, that's, <laughs> let me try to have a short answer. Um, I think, well, we, we had, there are many studies are performed and if you suffer from typical cataplexy, uh, you have a chance of about 95% that if you measure hypercretin in the, in the serospinal fluid, that will be a low or even undetectable concentration. So cataplexy is, let's say, a real warning or a real predictor of hypercretin deficiency. There are some persons, some patients, and these are particular children who may have hypercritin deficiency, but no cataplexy. But usually if you have follow up over time, uh, most of these persons will develop cat cataplexy over the years. So it seems that the hypercritin deficiency really is a marker of, of, of cataplexy. And the problem is the current classification is if you have no cataplexy, so you would from a clinical perspective qualify for NT2, but if you measure hypercretin and it's too low, then by definition you qualify for NT1. So that makes the discussion a bit difficult. If you are starting discussion, okay, is somebody suffering for cataplexy or is he or she not suffering from cataplexy, you have a different discussion. But now it's by definition, if you measure it and it's too low, then it is NT1. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, the diagnosis names. So idiopathic EDS in particular, kind of being the new name for, um, for a group of people. And that currently in the United States, and I don't know how this is in Europe, the medications are approved for IH and or narcolepsy. Well, none for IH yet, but hopefully at some point. But there is nothing for idiopathic EDS. So by creating this new category with a new diagnosis name, are we at risk of having to have new clinical trials for all the medications, because the various approving agencies will say that, oh, it hasn't been run in this, in this diagnosis category. Yeah, this is a very important question. And, and I already had a lot of discussion, particularly with, let's say, US colleagues, um, because I think my impression is that this is, well, an issue, particularly in the US, and that's maybe different from the most of European and other Western countries. Uh, but the problem is also with the classification because I was a member of the classification, uh, let's say the IC2 uh, more than 10 years ago and now in the revision committee of, of the current one. And we always have the discussion, okay, that we should take into account what will be the reaction, what will do reimbursement companies. But I'm afraid if we always are considering what they will do, we will never move forward. Uh, and that's yeah the difficulty. Uh, on the other hand, we should not just say, okay, we do not take into account what may happen with your insurance companies, uh, because it's uh, if our intention is that more patients get a diagnosis and more patients would receive a treatment they need, but the consequence is that there is no reimbursement, then, then the result will be the opposite of what we intend to reach. Exactly. But of course, we must take this into account, but I think there is also responsibility, I think on any doctor in the world, but also for US doctors, that you must, for some reason, try to convince 
things must change. And you know, I think even for insurance company in the long run, it's better to change this. Um, because if you only continue to, to, to organize your categories and your labels according to what insurance companies are used to, I don't think we will improve the situation for, for patients. But, but again, I, I can repeat myself, this is, is for sure a very precious issue and we must prevent that this may happen. Okay. Um, here's another question. In I don't the US, know if you're convinced. Huh? <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's a question we're asking at the Hypersomnia Foundation as well and trying to talk to people about what do you do? Because yes, it does make sense that as we learn more and as we get better at diagnosing, we should have the freedom to create the new categories that are discovered. Uh, so then what happens <laughs> back at back at the at the approving agencies and insurance companies is this open question. But it, it's also within our power to try and figure out what names might um, still allow us to create the categories, but do so in such a way that it makes it easier to, uh, to still get approval from the FDA or get an insurance company. And I think there's great concern over the word probable in particular. Yeah, I see the question. So that, that's yeah. also why I stressed and, and, and I know I see Julie Farker, I, I know we discussed this before and, and, and I'm really open for discussion. And I also discussed this with the Dutch patients, but they were less afraid it seemed, or maybe they are more polite to me, I don't know, but we must, of course, this is very important, but, but I, I want to stress, and I think that that's the problem that's occurring, it probably is not regarding if there is a serious problem, not regarding whether it's a hypersomnous. The problem is only about the category. And if you want to move forward, understanding causes and predict the efficacy of treatment, we must, let's say, make separations in homogeneous groups. Uh, that's the only way to identify biomarkers. We are looking for biomarkers for 40 years. We only identified hypercretin for a small group. And I'm really convinced we don't, and we'll never find any other biomarker if we continue to use these categories. We must yes. be open and we must be sure about homogeneous categories then we will probably be able to find biomarkers and then we will can move forward. Good, definitely want to do that. I mean, the yeah. major issue for the community is wanting to find those biomarkers and figure out what's wrong with this. So anything that we can do to help that would be greatly appreciated. So there is a question about um, how the European researchers who have developed this proposal are they communicating with the sleep experts in the United States? And kind of what's the process going forward? You've put out this proposal. What do you think might happen over the next couple of years before we could you know, actually come to essentially a global agreement on how to change diagnosis? Tell us a little bit about how that happens. Yeah, no, that's very important. No, for sure, we, we, we have uh, a lot of, of yeah, discussion, but also just does we know each other quite well. We, we speak quite often, of course, because of the, of the COVID uh, pandemic, it was a bit less. But we, we have close contact and close exchange of, of opinions. And, 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 and we really respect also the opinion of the, the US as colleagues. But, but one of the reasons we, we, we wanted to, to publish this is that, that in the discussion, what I already mentioned uh, as answer to one of the previous questions is, the US colleagues, they are really afraid for the insurance companies. And that's something I think content wise, I think with most of the colleagues, we don't have, let's say real different opinions. It's just, let's say the practical aspects, what will be the implications for the US situation. Mm -hmm. And that's that's making things complicated. But I think for, again, for, for much of what we propose or, or the problems we identify, we, we, we seem to agree. And I also think because I just explained, I'm a member of the revision task force of the ICSD3, and there are many American colleagues. Uh, and I do expect that the next classification will not be that different from the current, again, because of this reimbursement. But I do hope that it will, let's say, prepare for a change. 
as far as I'm concerned in the near future, but okay, that, that's not depending on me or the Europeans, because yeah. formally, it is formally a US classification. And what we do hope, we of course, we all want to have it a global accepted classification, but the problem might be if, if we get too much our own waste, then it might happen that we may choose for a European classification, but, but of course, our intention to have a global particularly because we don't have that much difference of opinion okay so it's good to know that everybody agrees this yeah. is where we need to go it's just yeah. we're trying to deal with the practical realities of these systems that are holding us back so is it easier in europe to order all these expensive tests and an extended sleep study and is it easier if you had a probable diagnosis that if you prescribed a medication as a physician in Europe, your patient is going to get it? And, and so it's just a different situation? Yeah, it really depends. Uh, I'm talking about urine, like, like it is a unity, but it's not really a unity. It, it really right. differs from country to country. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think in general, let's say this 32 hour protocol, I don't think there's any European country in which this will be reimbursed. Um, but in general, uh, ancillary investigation has presented nocturnal uh, polysomnography, MSLT, uh, those things. Also, acti also, actigraphy is reimbursed, and that's, that's an also a problem in the US. Actigraphy is not reimbursed. Also, arbitrator measurement is not reimbursed. And, and yeah, I, I really think this is, this is a problem. If, if for reimbursement reasons you don't use actigraphy, you really miss uh, many people who have chronic sleep deprivation, I think you should not treat chronic sleep deprivation as medication. You should treat this as, let's say, a change in lifestyle and people may feel much better. Uh, and the same holds true for hypercretin deficiency. Many may have, let's say, misdiagnosis because there is a very high threshold to perform a lumbar puncture for assessments of hypercretin because there is no reimbursement. And that's, that's different in Europe. We have reimbursement for hypocritic measures, we have reimbursement for actigraphy. Uh, and I think that would be a starting point already if that would, would change in the US. Right, right. And, and, and people would get very different diagnoses as a result yeah. if yeah. these tests were performed on a more regular basis. Yeah. We have many examples that people tell you in a consulting room and not that they say, okay, I sleep eight hours a day and have a regular schedule and then you measure it and it's it's not at all and I don't, I don't want to say that that these people are liars but some people even don't recognize their own problem only if it's measured then and they are confronted they, they realize i think people want the best for themselves but but some seem not to 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 identify their own problem and then you need more than than a diary or more than 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 history taking um, there's some I think some people are curious about some of the extended sleep testing. So uh, there, I'm getting some comments about how difficult it was um, as an IH patient to stay awake during the MSLT in between the naps and really stressful. And so now like there's this whole 32 hour protocol. Um, is that really difficult for the patients that you've put through that test? Is it is it a miserable sort of thing? Or are you free to sleep however long you want whenever you want, and it's actually less miserable than the MSLT. Well, well to, to, to be very clear, this is a French protocol. It's not a protocol that, that we perform in the Netherlands. It's not a protocol that I perform myself. But of course, okay. I, I know the French colleagues, and we had a lot of discussion about it. I presume that, it's, that the first MSLT day is very difficult, because in general, all for the daily practice, you know from many patients who, who undergo an MSLT that is difficult even if you're allowed to sleep 20 minutes it's maybe difficult to stay awake in between naps so this must be much more difficult and I would say staying 32 hours in bed in dim light and and and, and disconnected from from the outer world I, well I, it's a torture in my, my, my opinion but okay now I'm maybe <laughs> too negative I didn't try it myself so but I'm really in favor I think this is important for this thing for for research and probably if you ask the French they say okay it's not that that difficult so there are opinions and and they they performed it so they are more reliant than I am but I would prefer to to search for 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 let's say easier solutions and, and less demanding solutions okay um we probably have time for one more questions. I'm getting a, 
a couple of questions on people who have like dream devices or Fitbits and they're, so they I think they heard your message about how important actigraphy is and they're wanting to know whether or not the devices that they have and know can be used for actigraphy or what do you, what, what really needs to happen for diagnosis? Yeah, usually a Fitbit can be of use for sure. And then several of the apps as well, but it's, it's important. It's, it's a combination of, of the, the, the measurement of movement and also, uh, let's say, the, the diary, because sometimes it's, the, for example, let me explain. It's measuring movement. It's, in fact, measuring acceleration. If, let's say, you're riding a car uh, on a dirty road with a lot of uh, rocks and things, then you are sitting, but you have a lot of movements, a lot of acceleration, then it looks like you're very active. Uh, so that that may be a problem you you can encounter. And on the other hand, you, for example, may have a bed partner that is not sleeping very quietly, and that may be detected by the the actigraphy or by the Fitbit. So it's not just the actigraphy. The actigraphy is the the objective measure, but you need for interpretation a diary. What was the person doing to prevent misinterpretations? But in fact, if you have a diary and this information probably much of the information you could also get from a Fitbit or similar devices, yeah. Okay. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming and doing this presentation today and providing all this information. I wish we could have got to more questions, um, but- and They are um, off because we, we received a mail of Quinn Eastman. I see his question uh, in, 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 the, in the questions parts uh, as well. I think it's very interesting to suggest another name for idiopathic hypersomnia. That is, let's say that we don't use idiopathic, but maybe we can discuss this, let's say, uh, just among us and not in the whole group. But I think it's a very interesting suggestion. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, yes, yeah, no, I think that's great because there are a lot of people who really dislike the word idiopathic. Yeah, <laughs> it's I, a real I, problem, but unfortunately it, it, it it reflects uh, the reality of not really knowing what's causing um, the Yeah, disorder. so it's similar to probable. Uh, I see, we, we must continue this discussion. And, and again, maybe my last words that <laughs> is, is, it's a proposal that we do. And we yes. are for sure open for, for improvements. Uh, and I think it's very important how, how patients consider terms as idiopathic and also terms as probable, for sure. Yes. Yes, I think I think there's sort of a general feeling we like the idea of the new proposal, but some of the way that we are naming things could cause problems. And if we could just figure out different ways of naming the new categories to allow for our system to continue to work and for us to access the medications, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much again and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. So, yeah, that's the, that's the end of our webinar, but I do want to give out a, a shout out to the sleep wake cyclers before we leave. So if you out there haven't heard about the sleep wake cyclers yet, they are a team of people who are riding bikes and motorcycles to raise money for research on idiopathic hypersomnia and related sleep disorders. So each rider has made a commitment to raise a minimum of $300 with some riders raising up to $1,500. And one month from tomorrow on June 12th, that's the big day. So um, the goal of the team is to raise $20,000. And as of today, we're a little bit over 7,000. So we're a bit away from our goal and we really need your help. So if you would like to donate to the team and help us raise money for research so we can get rid of the idiopathic nature of our disorder, please go to hypersomniafoundation.org. And at the very top of the homepage, you can click on the banner for the sleep wake cyclers. So a donation of any amount would be fantastic. And if you think you might wanna join the team and help us uh, raise money, we have one month left, it's not too late. You can email me at rebecca at hypersomniafoundation.org. So last but not least, in just a moment, a very short survey on today's program will pop up on your screen and we'd really appreciate it if you take a few minutes and fill it out. On behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation, our thanks to all of you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.